Again, today is the 4th of July. It's Independence Day. Uh, people will gather this weekend uh, with picnics and swimming parties, eating hot dogs, watching the fireworks. Did anybody see the fireworks last night? Anybody watch some fireworks? We walked to the end of our street and watched it as they uh, took place at Flavette Field at the University of Florida. And uh, that was wonderful. But it's the birthday of our nation. Let me take you back to 1776 for a moment. July 4th, 1776, 56 men in New World colonies founded on religious freedom gathered to take a stand against political tyranny. These men stood around a table and they signed their names to a document that we celebrate today, the Declaration of Independence. Together they pledged their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor to a grand experiment. Somebody help Pete here. Thank you. I'll take a moment here. As they're tending to Peter, let's uh, say a prayer. God, we lift up our brother, and we just pray that you would watch over him, that you would uh, uh, help him with what he needs right now. We're grateful for your hand sustaining him to this point. We just pray that you continue to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. Pete has had vasovagal responses where you stand up too fast and you, you, you fall. I don't know if we have a wheelchair, if somebody can check back here in, in Ray's area. Uh, thanks, Ted. We're fortunate here in Gainesville to have so many medical professionals. We have nurses and doctors that attend our church. But they'll tend to Pete. And here, here's a wheelchair that would be helpful. All right, thank you guys for praying. Uh, for one another. One of the things that I love about this church, and especially in our 8 o'clock service, we meet in the chapel over here. It's a very smaller uh, room, uh, but we tend to one another. We care for each other. We pray for one another, lift up each other, and uh, often in real time, uh, God is right there for us to do so. So, <clears throat> back to 1776, these men stood around a table and signed their names to the Declaration of Independence. And together they pledge their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor to a grand experiment, an idea of a republic in which balanced order and individual liberty were the law of the land. An experiment where charity and religion were free to thrive and where sovereignty rested with the citizens who granted government its rule. Um, I read an article about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, Pat Boone wrote something on this, and, and here are his words. There had never been anything like it, and the very idea seemed impossible. But most of the people living in those colonies had simply had enough of British domination, of working and virtually existing at the pleasure of a king they didn't know, and who obviously considered them his indentured servants. They wanted to be free to make their own decisions, to govern themselves, and breathe the sweet air of liberty. So they staked their very lives, he said, on that fourth day of July, 1776, on an outrageous gamble, an impossible dream of freedom. And in the next few days, they began to taste what being free might be like. The first celebration of American independence took place four days later in Philadelphia, where the Continental Congress was still meeting, the ceremony began with a public reading of the Declaration of Independence. Then, from the tower of the State House, now called Independence Hall, the Liberty Bell rang out. The coat of arms of the King of England was taken down, and there was a parade, and cannons boomed. The people, though aware of what lay ahead, cheered. A new nation sprang to life. How many of you memorized the Declaration of Independence or the preamble, the beginning of that in school? You remember this? Just a couple of, uh, uh, of thoughts from it. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds or bands which have connected them with one another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And then it goes on from there, and we are all uh, beneficiaries of that. As the result of the courage of those 56 men who affixed their names to the Declaration of Independence, 
we became what we honestly believe to be the greatest democracy in the history of the world. And what I mean by that is there are many governments and many different ways of governing ourselves. But we believe that this is the greatest experiment because it gives freedom to human beings to live the way God created us to live. Now, to be clear, we're not a perfect democracy. We know that and we've never claimed to be. Our grand experiment is a noble one, but it's not one that has been made available to all people at all times. Now, the kingdom of God is a perfect kingdom. America is not. We understand they are not the same thing. And we recognize that the, the kingdom of God informs us so that we can be American citizens to our greatest and highest ideals. But we have much to work out to better in living into our American ideals. We can acknowledge the good in our culture while simultaneously confronting its evils. And we do that, and we do that vociferously at times. As Christ followers, we know the ever-present tension of living between the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world, of being proud of our national heritage, just as South African Christ followers are proud to be South Africans. And Filipinos are proud to be Filipinos and Cubans, and Chinese, and Guatemalans, and Peruvians, and on and on and on. While at the same time, as Christ followers, we can call out the respective uh, nations, the things in our respective nations, which the gospel calls out in our human lives. And we are grateful for the freedom to do that, and the respect to do that. This is an American experiment, and this is what we celebrate today. It's founded upon the Judeo-Christian principle that no person or people should ever exist under the tyranny of another person or people or government. It's a message that all people can and should be free. And we believe that it is a revelation from God, as well as the pursuit of every human heart made in God's image, that we are to live in freedom, not ruled by anything outside our consent. You will remember Jesus Christ came and he said words like these. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to kill, to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may, might have life, life to the full. And so the thief comes in, he's talking about being the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. It's the thief that climbs up some other way and takes advantage, that misuses and abuses power for their own ends, maybe out of insecurity and cowardice, or for selfish gain or fame. But I, by contrast, have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. In John 8, he says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And John says in 1 John 3, 8, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So he comes to liberate to set captives free. In fact, it's his personal mission statement that he reads in his own words in, uh, in the synagogue in his hometown of Capernaum. He stood up and they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he reads these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Freedom must not only be lived, it must be proclaimed. We see it as our Christian and human duty to declare freedom and to proclaim it wherever people are in bondage. There's a passage in the scripture. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles if you have it. Some of you have electronic versions. And I know that we put this, the words on the screen behind me, and that's helpful. But it's also helpful for us to, to know our own particular scriptures. Sometimes the Lord will uh, speak something and you want to underline that or write in the margin something that you, you sense God is saying to you personally. And that becomes something uh, not only helpful for you, but for succeeding generations as they look back at moms or dads or grandfathers' uh, Bible to see the way that God spoke to you. Let's look in Luke chapter 13, verse 10 to 17. This is a demonstration of how Jesus not only talked about freedom, but actually brought freedom about. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. 
Some translations say she was crippled uh, for 18 years. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over. And he said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. There are six days in which work should be done. I'm sorry, go back to that. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox? or his donkey from the stall, and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not be released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, but the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. Now, a few thoughts about that passage and what happened that Sabbath. This was a a church woman, not a Christian back in that day. She was a part of the people of Israel. But she went to synagogue. She was a believer, and Jesus calls her a daughter of Abraham. And I just wrote down, just from my own thoughts there, illnesses and sufferings at the hands of the devil can happen to faithful people, can't they? Anybody here ever suffer? Let's be honest. Look around. (laughs) We all have. Anybody had an illness that didn't make sense and threatened your life? And some we have lost who are no longer among us because they did succumb to the illness, to the cancer, whatever it is. For 18 years she suffered, probably progressively, more and more. That would be like since 2003 until now. Can you imagine being sick and and, and just being bent over more and more and more until you, you just didn't have the freedom you once enjoyed. Another thought I wrote down, Jesus is able and willing to heal us. No matter how long or how bad the condition has been progressing in your life, since 2003 or since 1993, he came to destroy the bad things the devil brings upon people. That's one of the purposes Christ came into the world. And then a contrast. When God frees people, those in power get upset. Because now they're not in power any longer. And somebody's coming along who has just as much, if not more power, and that's Jesus. But when Jesus sets people free and brings equity or equality, rather, people get upset because it it, it shifts the balance of power that we've enjoyed for so long. But by contrast, when we are freed, when we are the ones, when we are the woman who for 18 years was bound and tied, we naturally want to glorify God. And so what have you ever been set free from? Have there been circumstances in your life where you were bound, but today you're not, and you look back and you say, only God, (laughs) only God could do that. That was a God thing in my life. How does it feel to be set free from something that bound you? Jesus declares and proclaims freedom from lots of things. Uh, You might want to write these down, but there's a a thousand more. He sets us free from controlling habits, from addictions even. How many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have been set free from an addiction because of Christ in your life? U2 is a a great band. I, I didn't like them when they first came out in the 1980s. They were ahead of their time, actually. They didn't fit. Uh, Monica, that's like your favorite band, right? And your husband, Curtis, was telling me the other day, he's like, he, he wouldn't choose to listen to YouTube, but if there's a concert, he'll go to the concert. He says, a fantastic concert. But Bono is the lead singer of U2, and here's his testimony on being freed from habits and patterns of thought. Your nature is a hard thing to change, he says. It takes time. I have heard of people who have life-changing, miraculous turnarounds, People set free from addiction after a single prayer. Relationships saved where both parties let go and let God. But it was not like that for me. For all that I was lost, I am found, it is probably more accurate to say I was really lost 
I'm a little less so at the moment. And then a little less and a little less again. To me, that is the spiritual life. He says the slow reworking and rebooting the computer at regular intervals, reading the small print of the service manual. It has slowly rebuilt me in a better image. It has taken years, though, and it is not over yet. Jesus sets us free from controlling habits and thought patterns and even physical and psychological addictions. He does. And sometimes he does that suddenly, and sometimes he does that progressively, but he does that because he came to set us free from the devil's works. Jesus also proclaims freedom from the past, from past failures, from painful memories and regrets and remorse. We won't be defined by our mistakes. We look back, and in this time we're living, it's a strange time where people will pull back your 20 years ago, something that you wrote when you were 15 years of age, and they'll say, see, this is a despicable human being because of that, so we should cancel this person and discredit them completely. But if that were true, all of us would be canceled because it's a progression of what God is doing in our lives. Jesus can set us free from the sins of my youth and then even from soul ties that we have with people even from the grave. People who have gone on and yet that domineering mother or that absent father that we could never satisfy. Those authority figures can still play a role in my my life and in your life, in our thoughts, in the way that we behave. Jesus can set you free from that. Jesus also proclaims and declares freedom from fear, from the fear of others, what others think. And I don't know if, if that's ever been something that bound you, that you're always wondering, well, what are the neighbors going to think if I do it this? What do the people, what do the other Christians think if I do this? I was sitting next to a gentleman yesterday at the barber shop, and uh, I go to Style Cuts. Style Cuts, uh, uh, Dave uh, Ratliff has been cutting my hair uh, probably for 20 years or so, or since I, about 30 years now that I've been married into this family. Uh, my father-in-law would go there, and his father, Colin, would cut his hair. But I was sitting in the, in the, uh, uh, lobby area and I was talking about how I had an opportunity to go out to Utah a few weeks ago and I said we went to uh, Bryce Canyon we went to Hole in the Rock and I was talking to a buddy of mine who happened to be there and this guy next to me I didn't know he's just like oh yeah Hole in the Rock I said oh you've been there he says I'm from Utah and it struck up a conversation about how he was raised in a very religious setting Mormon but how he, he says, I, I'm Mormon today, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, but I don't ever want to go back to Utah. And we talked about how, how suffocating it could be to live by the laws and the rules of the, do this, don't do that. And he mentioned something. As I'm looking at it, he's got tattoos all the way down his arm. He said, when I got my first tattoo and I come back to church, and the way the people were looking at me, it just made him feel like he wasn't quite up to snuff kind of thing. And it was actually a beautiful time. I, I didn't expect this. I didn't know this was going to happen this day. But it led me to giving my own testimony that how I grew up in a religious household as well. And I thought I knew what it meant to be a Christian. But that when I met Jesus, the person, he changed everything. And it's not religion that he's after. It's relationship with God. And as I'm sharing this with this guy, just so naturally, I just stopped and listened. Everybody was quiet. Everybody was listening to that testimony. So I'm praying that that seed went in there somewhere. And then somebody's going to take that and move on like somebody planted a seed in my life and in your life. And we did something with that later. But Jesus can break the power of fear of what others think about you. And some of you have been there and you're not there anymore. And I'm very refreshed when I'm around people who just don't care what anybody else thinks because Jesus has set them free. The fear of our enemies, the fear of bad people and systems and bullies, and ultimately the fear of death. I have forgotten. I've got to go back and remember. And some of of us all need to do that because I remember being afraid. If I die, it's not going to go well for me. And now that's not a part of my day-to-day thought process. I don't think about that anymore. But a lot of folks are bound up with that. Jesus sets us free. Jesus wants you to be free from guilt and from shame and from past failures and from current strife. I read the story of Shauna Pilate. She'd had enough. It was a Sunday morning in January, and her husband Rick 
was still wasn't home from his Saturday night partying. I was at home with my son Drake, she said. He was three at the time. And it was very common for Rick, my husband, to be out all night. I always knew there was unfaithfulness. That bothered me naturally. But I was worried about Rick's safety, that he was going to turn up someplace dead. And that morning, I was at the end of my rope. And so as she angrily was washing the dishes, she had the TV on. She noticed a man speaking on the television. She was quickly drawn to his message. He was funny and warm, she said, and seemed to be speaking at my level. I felt something come over me that I can't explain. I couldn't quit crying. And at the end of the program, it said, join us, and it gave the name of the church in her town. I couldn't get my son dressed fast enough, she said. On the way to the church, Shauna had one purpose in mind, getting emotionally strong enough to kick her husband out. She had tried using marijuana, alcohol, and various relationships to put Rick out of her heart. Now she thought she had found the answer. But God had a different idea in mind. At the end of the message that morning, the pastor invited people to give their lives to Christ. And Shauna found herself raising her hand. She said, I never looked back. Three weeks later, my husband asked if he can join us at church. Rick knew that his behavior was hurting his family, but he was held captive to drugs and sexual addictions. After four or five weeks, he said, of attending church with his wife, he recognized his need for Christ. Still, the following months weren't easy. I was going to church and wanting to do right, he says, but I kept doing wrong. It wasn't until a Promise Keeper seminar, you remember Promise Keepers, that he finally came to understand the importance of repentance in accepting the forgiveness God offers in Christ by faith. That day, Rick went home and told his wife, I can be the husband you need me to be now. Rick and Shauna's life took a 180 degree turn that day. They became active in the church and now serve as volunteers who share the hope of God's restoration and forgiveness with struggling couples. When I think how Jesus can change people, no matter how deep in sin they are, he says, that overwhelms me. If he did it for us, he can do it for anybody. Encountering Jesus, the person, brings freedom. That's the message this morning. The self-expression of God himself is Jesus Christ. And he sets people free. And it's because he has all authority. In the book of Mark, in my Bible, on the margins of every page, it shows Jesus having authority over sickness, having authority over hunger, having authority over the demons, having authority over death itself, having authority over the Sabbath, having the authority over the disciples in our very lives. It just the shows in the book of Mark the, the authority that Jesus Christ has. He has all authority. And the question is, does Jesus have authority in your life? Does he have the rightful place of authority over your habits, over your thought patterns, over your addictions, over your past? Have you given him the sovereign control over the things that you are bound to of past regrets and mistakes and remorse? How about fear of what others think or enemies and truly bad people out there, those who have hurt you? Have you given him the authority that he comes with over death itself? He does this by the Holy Spirit. It's by the power of Christ lent to us, given to us, in something called sanctifying grace that we've talked about this summer. When the signers of America's Declaration of Independence pledged their names to that document, declaring freedom from tyranny, they knew it might cost them dearly. And we've all heard stories of how they paid with their lives, and a lot of that's urban legend, but this is true. Benjamin Franklin, quote, he said, we must hang together, gentlemen, else we shall most assuredly hang separately. What we're doing here by signing our lives over together to this experiment may cost us our very lives, and we know of the war that, that began this nation. We know also of the wars that have protected those freedoms that we enjoy today. Since the time the original signers affixed their names to the Declaration of Independence, many have paid with their hard work, their sacrifice, and even their very lives for the freedoms that we enjoy today. 
in the great United States of America. Freedom is not free, however. It costs dearly to provide it and to protect it. Jesus was sent from God the Father to pay the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his very life. Who he was, the gift that God gave to him in life, he exchanged that so that you and I might have freedom. To proclaim freedom for the captives and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Here and now, as well as eternally, Jesus gave his life for our freedom. Freedom to live unencumbered lives, life to the full. To move beyond the past that binds us and keeps us entangled. To forgive those who have hurt us. To have the freedom to let them go. To live without fear. To live with power over the things that once held us captive by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Do you know this freedom? I don't know if every person in this room or every person watching online has this freedom, but it can be yours today. You can meet the person, Jesus Christ. And you can just, with a prayer, turn your life over to him, as it were, to fix your name to the document that says, I'm declaring my independence from my past. I'm declaring my independence from my sin. My independence from fear, from the things that have held me down too long. And now I claim my dependence upon you. Have me. Receive me into your home. And here's what will happen. For every person who repents of their past and walks away from that towards the Lord, by faith receiving the gift that he makes available, every one of us, what he'll do is he'll wipe your slate clean. He'll take away the sins. They're gone. They're no no longer yours. He paid the price for that. And then he will give you himself in the person of the Holy Spirit to walk not only with you but in you. And with that power, you and I, we learn each and every day more and more what it means to please the Lord, to bring a smile to his face and a smile to others' faces by the way we live our lives. If anybody would like to do that, we will do that before we enjoy communion here, and then we will have communion together. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we're grateful for this great nation that we all come to celebrate over 300 million American citizens, Lord. And we celebrate the freedoms that were purchased and protected for us throughout the ages. Thank you for these past 245 years or whatever it's been. Thank you for that. But Father, we thank you even more for the freedom that Christ came to bring for every person, for the billions who come into life. And for those who are here right now, Lord, listening in and wanting to taste freedom, wanting to repent and turn from their past, turn from their fears, turn from their addictions, and turn to your son Jesus. We pray that you would hear them as they simply say a prayer something like this. And if that's you, just pray in your heart of hearts this prayer. God, I want to know you as Father. I want to come home. I want to come into your family. And I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to give me power that I don't have on my own. I want you to give me purpose and direction in my life. I need meaning and significance. And I'm sensing that you have that for me. So would you give that to me? I thank you for forgiving me my sins in Christ Jesus. Teach me how to live, to please you, to please others in the way of inviting them to know Christ themselves. Father, we pray for all of those who have said this prayer that you would give them your Holy Spirit, seal them, draw them into your family and do a work that only God can do to set captives free. In Christ's name we pray, amen. If you said that prayer, that's that's the most powerful thing that you will ever do in life is to give your life to Christ. And you may not fully understand that right now, but he understands that. And all of us who have done that look back and we say, wow, that was the defining moment of my life, what Jesus did for me. In fact, Jesus says, every sinner who turns to God, we're all sinners, every sinner who turns to God, there is a celebration in heaven before the angels of God. And so that's amazing what's happening. Now, one of the things Jesus did is he left us with a, 
a, a ritual, a rite uh, called the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. And it's the table of the Lord. It's been set for all who would become disciples. You don't have to be one yet, but this could be the very thing that leads you in. And so this may be the very first day that you're, you're doing this. If you're at home, I hope that you got some juice and have a piece of bread or crackers. And here on your seat, you have this little uh, cup, and you could take the lid off of it. It's got a wafer in the top, and then it has juice in the bottom. This is the way that we can do this and practice social distancing right now until we can get through the COVID. But uh, hear me as I pray the prayer over the elements, and I will even say in there the bread and the blood, but just listen through that, and then at the end, we will all partake together, and we will drink together. Also, let me mention this. On um, Communion Sunday, the first Sunday of every month, uh, we take up a special offering called a benevolence, and that is you have been helping people in our church and in our community who find themselves uh, in economic tough times for example or they they're in need of food they're in need of all sorts of things and it, so what we do is on the first sunday communion sunday we ask if you could bring a special offering and leave that you could do it electronically like we did you could do it in a check you could leave it on the altar however we will put all that together and those monies will be used to help one another and we do it in a way that preserves dignity nobody knows who's being helped father we thank you for setting the table for us we thank you for taking the bread as you did 2,000 years ago on the night in which he was betrayed into the hands of sinners. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks to the Father and broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper, he took the cup and gave thanks to the Father and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. Father, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and the cup, making them the body and the blood of Jesus. For us, we who you are your body, redeemed by the blood of Christ, pour out your Spirit on us and send us out these doors to be your ambassadors to others, to invite them to the table of the Lord. For there is a place set. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. You take the bread, the body of Christ, given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Father, in our remaining moments, I just want to say a special prayer for anybody who's really struggling in any way. There are people who are sick. There are people in the hospital, even with COVID, who are fighting for their life. We remember them now. There are marriages in trouble, and we pray for them. There are folks grieving the loss of people in their lives and relationships that are no more. There are all sorts of things that plague us, but God, we, we want to pray for one another. Hear us as we pray. I'm going to take a, just a few moments of silent meditation and just lift up the needs that you're aware of. Father, we are thankful that you call us together. You say, where two or more are gathered, I'm there in your presence, but when two or more agree on earth, we shall be bound in heaven. And so, Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray that you would give us testimonies to share with one another where we've seen you answer the very prayers that are lifted up in this place and lifted up for one another. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. If you will stand and receive the benediction, we will go. And again, I invite you on the portico to stop by. And uh, there's a cake out there for, for uh, Walker and for Jordan as they uh, start their life together. You guys should actually go out there so they can greet you, all right? Uh, but receive the benediction. 
May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Happy Independence Day. See you next week.